Well, every psalm has its own personality, as does Psalm 30, which is the psalm to which we turn today. Once again, these are psalms that God used to encourage my heart when I was going through cancer. And I actually was so excited about the truth of these psalms that I wrote a book, and the book was based upon these psalms. The original title of the book was The Bend in the Road. Uh, Later, the publisher changed the title of the book to When Your World Falls Apart, and it is one of the best-selling books every year at Turning Point. You know why? I'll tell you why. My father once told me this when he was coaching me on preaching. He said, David, if you preach to broken hearts, you will always have an audience. And he was absolutely right about that, because every week when I stand up to preach and look out over the thousands of people who come to Shadow Mountain, I'm aware of just a few but I know they represent many who've had a tough week. Their hearts are broken. And their their lives seem to have gone astray. And the Word of God is what nourishes them up and helps them get going, and that's why I'm so committed to it. And believe that when you teach God's Word, God uses His Word to mend broken hearts. That's kind of where we're going today with life's ups and downs, and we'll get to it in a moment. Just let me encourage you, if you haven't done so already, to get your copy of this ancillary book, which is meant to help you during times when things are not so good for you and you may not even be able to sleep. I've seen all the sleep commercials on television, and actually, Don and I tried a couple of them, and they don't work. (laughs) You know, I hate to say that, but if if you're having a busy time and you're trying to sleep, I don't know of anything that makes it easier for you to sleep than to have the Word of God flowing through your mind and washing over your soul. So we have a hundred readings that were written specifically from the Word of God to comfort you and to bring peace to your heart just before you go to sleep at night. And they're all beautifully designed and in a beautiful gift book called Sleep on This. It's got a padded cover, and each of the readings is accompanied by a QR code that makes it possible for you to have somebody else. If you're so tired you can't even read it, Well, just put it on your phone, and they'll read it to you, and then you can sleep. We want to send this to you because we know it'll add value to your life and bring blessing to your heart. So when you send a gift during August, be sure to ask for your copy of Sleep on This, a gift of any size, no matter what it is. Be generous. Do the best thing you can. But whatever your gift is, you can have a copy of this book, and we'll send it to you right away. Let's get started with today's lesson. Seminary professor once chastised a student for turning in a sermon that had a very boring title. He was trying to teach this young man to be a better preacher, and he said to him, sermon titles have to be catchy, and they have to be relevant, they have to be engaging. So I want you to take this sermon and bring it back tomorrow with a new title that will grab hold of people and make them want to listen. Well, the young man wasn't exactly sure what he was being asked to do, so he said, how do I come up with a catchy title? Well, the professor said, it's easy. Just imagine that your sermon title is posted on a sign in front of your church. It's Sunday morning, and a big bus full of people has stopped momentarily by your sign. You want a sermon title so catchy, so compelling, that all the people on the bus will jump off of the Greyhound and run into your church. Just think of it that way, and I'm sure you'll come up with a great title. The student left to ponder the matter, and the next day he returned with his new title. There's a bomb on your bus. (laughs) That'd get him into church, wouldn't it? If nothing else would do that. Sometimes as I look out at our world, and I'm sure you've had the same emotion, I wonder if we're not riding on a bus that's got a bomb hidden on it somewhere. (laughs) If it's the cultural problems that we face, the moral and uh, ethical problems that we face, but it seems like there's a heightened sense of concern on the part of people as to where this bus is going after all. I don't know how you relate to that, but the journey is filled with a lot of peaks and valleys. There's a lot of ups and downs, and, and it's not like some people expect when you become a Christian that from then on life is just going to be kind of a sailing on a a cruise ship for the rest of your life until you ultimately sail into the harbor of heaven. Most of us have found out that the Christian life is filled with a lot of challenges and there are a lot of ups and downs in the Christian life. In some respects life is like a soccer game. It seems like you play hard through the entire game 
and never really score any goals. But then nobody else does either, so you don't feel too bad. You get kicked and bruised and knocked down and you quickly get back up and into the game and avoid getting penalties as best you can with the exception of the normal kinds of mistakes that are part of the game. And then the entire game is over and it's ultimately decided by the flick of a hand in the goal, a mere deflection, one defining moment, and everybody says, that's the game. And you've played so hard for so long and it came down to one defining moment in your life. And throughout the game, if you were like me, your emotions were rocketed from one extreme to another, from disappointment to acceleration, from anger at what you thought was unfair and maybe unsportsmanlike conduct on the part of the other team, and then admiration of a play that was well executed. From total fatigue to the discovery of energy that you found them dredge up from somewhere you didn't know where. And it seems like that's the way life is, isn't it? It's a lot of effort over a long period of time, and it ends up being decided by one or two defining moments along the way. And all of us know that we're the product of the ups and downs of life. Psalm 30 is an honest expression on the part of a psalmist of life. That's why I love the Psalms so much. I find myself here, I find my emotions here, I find the things I have felt and thought of here expressed in ways much better than I could ever express them. The superscription over the Psalm, if you'll notice carefully, says that it's a song at the dedication of the house of David. And that's caused a lot of confusion on the part of uh, scholars because the only house that David really built himself was his own house. That was built by Hiram when he became king. And most people do not believe this psalm fits that occasion, but rather that it is meant to describe the events that were involved when David brought the ark back to Jerusalem and set it up in Jerusalem as the final resting place for the ark of the covenant where the temple would ultimately be built. And as you read the psalm, you begin to see that there are many connections with it that have to do with that particular event as recorded in 2 Samuel. You see, when David became the king over Israel after waiting for such a long time to be finally crowned king, when he came into his kingdom, his first desire, according to the Old Testament, was to go and get the Ark of the Covenant and bring it back to Jerusalem so that it would be central to the worship of God's people. Now, the Ark of the Covenant, as we've learned already, represents the presence of Almighty God. In the Old Testament system of worship, the Ark of the Covenant was that which represented the Shekinah glory of God, the, the presence of Almighty God. Now I was reading again what happened when the Philistines got a hold of the Ark of the Covenant. Do you remember that? And the Ark of the Covenant went throughout Philistia, and everywhere it ended, there was all kinds of problems. And frankly, they finally got to the place where they didn't want anything to do with the Ark of the Covenant, and they sent it away. Well, for many years now, the Ark of the Covenant had not been at the center of Israel's worship. In fact, during the time when King Saul was in the office, the Bible says that during Saul's reign, nobody even inquired about the Ark of the Covenant. They didn't even ask any questions about it. But David knew that the Ark of the Covenant was central to the worship of Almighty God, and so it was his desire to bring it back to Jerusalem. And as soon as he became king, that was his intention. Well, unfortunately, he assigned this project to some of the people in his kingdom who weren't very well studied in terms of the Old Testament law. And if you read the story in the Old Testament, you'll discover that they went to get the Ark of the Covenant and they didn't follow the instructions for moving the Ark of the Covenant because in the book of Numbers, there are detailed instructions as to how this piece of furniture was to be moved. They thought the most convenient way to get it from where it was to Jerusalem was to put it on an ox cart and just take it on down to the city. Well, that was not the way you were supposed to move the Ark of the Covenant. And on their way down, they came to a place called the threshing floor of Obed-Edom. And the Bible says that the oxen stumbled. And when the oxen stumbled, the cart kind of jolted. And a man by the name of Uzzah reached out to steady the Ark of the Covenant on the cart so that it wouldn't fall off. And as soon as he touched the Ark of the Covenant, he died right there on the spot. He was just fried in a moment. <laughs> And the Bible says that David got angry. Now, I don't know why he would get angry, because God had said that's what would happen if anybody touched that piece of furniture in that way. God had told him that was the penalty because it represented the holiness of God. But the Bible says David was angry. In fact, 
He was so angry that his anger turned into fear. And in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, we read that David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how in the world can the ark of the Lord come to me? So he would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David, but he took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite for three months. In other words, David was so bent out of shape over what happened and so afraid of what had happened that he said, just leave it where it is. I don't want anything to do with it. I'm not bringing it back to Jerusalem now. Let's just abandon this project and get back to other things. Well, the interesting thing about this story is that after the Ark of the Covenant had been in the house of Obed-Edom for about three months, word trickled back down to Jerusalem that everything Obed-Edom touched was turning to gold. Everything that he did was so successful because the Bible says that the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom because the Ark of the Covenant was present. And all of a sudden, David got renewed interest in getting the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And so this time, he went back and he studied the Old Testament law, and he found out how it was supposed to be done, and he went back and he got the Ark of the Covenant. And it tells us in 2 Samuel chapter 6, beginning at verse 12, that David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. And so it was when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. And many scholars believe that it was at that particular moment that Psalm 30 was born. That David wrote that song for right there in that moment when the joy of the Lord was on him and the ark of the covenant was returning to its special place. Well, it was a glorious and exciting day. But I want you to just think back for a moment over the story I've just briefly told you and look at the ups and downs in David's life. He went from being angry and afraid to being overwhelmed with joy. He went from being mad at God because something he did in the flesh failed to being filled with exhilaration to the point where he couldn't contain himself. And I rather suspect that most of us have been on that up and down trail through much of our life. How many of you know that there are peaks and valleys and sometimes the height of the wave, the crest of the wave determines the depth of the trough that comes after it. Isn't that true? And you know, life is hard to navigate like that. We're going along trying to make sense out of it and we just can't. And I often think about that as a pastor. I don't know of any career that you could ever sign up for, any position you could ever take that would challenge your emotional equilibrium more than being a pastor. You go from a party at night to celebrate somebody's anniversary, to a wedding the next day, to a funeral the following day, to the hospital, to people in trouble, and your emotions are all over the place. And I think that's much of what David was talking about. In fact, in the Psalm, and we're gonna do this quickly, there are five contrasting experiences that are pointed out by the psalmist in the ups and downs of life. He begins in the first four verses and in verses 8 through 10 with the cycle from hurting to healing. We do not know exactly what was going on in David's life at this time because we have no record in the narrative that David ever had a serious sickness. But a number of his psalms allude to the fact that he experienced some sickness in his life that was nigh unto death. And here in the 8th verse of the 30th Psalm, we read these words which are the prayer of David about his own situation in life. A prayer for his healing. Notice the 8th verse of the 30th Psalm. I cried to you, O Lord, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it declare your truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me and be my helper. Now, the interesting thing is David's praying because he's sick and he's arguing with God. He's saying, Lord, let me just plead my case with you for a moment. Why are you letting me be sick and why am I almost dead? Lord, what profit is there in my blood? If I die, is my dust going to praise you? Lord, you let me die. You're going to lose a worshiper. I mean, that's kind of the argument that David is bringing before the Lord. What good is there? I can't do you any good when I'm dead, Lord. Why don't you let me live and then I'll worship you and praise you. And the one thing you have to say for David's argument is at least his argument was not totally self-centered as most of ours are. He seemed to be concerned about the glory of God and he said, if you'll save me, I'll be one more worshiper who will bring honor and glory to your name. And finally, he gets a sense in his head and he quits all this argument And he just pleads to God for mercy. In the last verse, he says, Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me and be my helper. And that's where we end up. 
And if you've ever been sick or you've ever found out that you have something that is scary to you in terms of sickness, that's kind of the way you pray. Lord, you may argue with him about lots of things, but when you get right down to the end of it, you say, Lord, I need your mercy. Please, please help me. So he prays for his healing. And then in verses 1 through 4, we see the praise for his healing. For this is what happens after God heals him. In you, O Lord, I put my trust. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you and you healed me. Sing praise to the Lord, ye saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. Now here's the picture. Wherever David is in this situation in his life, he has gone down almost to the grave. And he says, O Lord God, I extol you, for you have lifted me up. And the word lifted up from the Hebrew language is the same expression that's used for dipping a bucket down into a well and drawing water up out of the well. David has this picture in his mind, Lord God, you reached right down into the grave and you pulled me right out of the grave. I was almost gone. And the interesting thing is the word extol means to lift up. And so if you read the text that way, David is saying, I will lift you up, O Lord, because you lifted me up. I'm going to lift you up in praise because you lifted me up. And he begins to praise God for his healing. Anyone who's ever been through a life-threatening experience or a difficult disease knows that when God brings you back from that disease, you just can't ever wake up any morning without thanking him for the light of day. You can't get up any day without thanking the Lord for his goodness to you, to give you another day. And you see the colors differently and you see the beauty of his world differently and your heart is filled with joy for the renewed opportunity to be alive. In fact, this is what David says. He says, Lord, you healed me and you kept me alive. How many of you know that when God heals you or whether he doesn't heal you, if you're alive today, it's because God's keeping you alive. And every day, whether you've ever experienced a threat to that or not, you should get up and look out at the world in which he's placed you and say, Lord God, thank you for keeping me alive. Through another day, through another night, I lift up my voice and my hands to you in praise for your goodness. Notice David is gone now from hurting to healing. And then notice the purpose for his healing, which is in the fourth verse. And we'll touch on that a little bit later. But he just says, he turns now and addresses the people. And he says, sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. When people have prayed for somebody who is sick and God raises them up, it's just as much their responsibility to praise God for the healing as it was for them to pray for the healing in the first place. And I know that for many of you, you've prayed for those who've been ill, but have you always been careful to give praise to God when he has healed them? Sometimes when the healing comes, the pressure's off and we forget. We're so careful to say, Lord, if you'll do this, I'll give you praise, but then we don't often do it. So David exhorts the people, sing praise, you his saints, and give thanks to God and remember his goodness because of his healing. Now you see, the first contrast is one of going from hurting or ill health to healing. And it's kind of a long way between the two. He goes secondly to another contrast, from hurting to healing and now from weeping to joy. Notice what verse five says. It says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. From weeping to joy. Now, most of the time, weeping and joy don't go together. I've noticed one exception, and that is that sometimes women cry when they're happy. I don't understand that completely, but I've seen them say, I'm just so happy, you know, and I'm trying to figure that out. I can't understand it, you know. But most of the time, weeping goes with sadness and joy goes with gladness. And David now is talking about this big chasm that exists between the ups and the downs of weeping and joy. And you know, you can experience those things in just a moment of time. You can be filled with joy one moment and in tears the next because events change and things happen. I want you to notice two things about this little expression, this little contrast between weeping and joy. First of all, this is an everyday truth. This doesn't even necessarily have to come from the Bible to be true, but it is true. It's good common sense that when a person's going through a difficult thing, You can usually say to that person with meaning and not be false in doing it, you know what, it's not gonna be like this forever. Just hang on, it's gonna get better. 
Just hang on, you'll get through this. One of the great verses of the Bible, which has been a bit misinterpreted with this little phrase, is, but I like this misinterpretation. Some guy was asked what his favorite verse in the Bible was, and he said his favorite verse in the Bible was this, and it came to pass. It didn't come to stay, it came to pass. And you know, and that's kind of the way it is. A lot of people think, you know, when you go through trouble, it's forever. But the Bible says, weeping comes in the nighttime, but joy comes in the morning. And it is true. This is an everyday truth. And I see this all the time as a pastor. Sometimes when we're paying tribute to someone that we've loved who has gone on to be with the Lord, and you look at the sadness in the faces of the family members and you think, it'll never ever be all right with them. But then a year later or so, you see that somehow God has healed over the open wound and he's brought back some gladness and joy. I was talking with a pastor friend of mine just recently. They've just gone through some tragic things with one of their children. And his wife said, I looked at my husband the other day and I said, I wonder if we'll ever smile again. <laughs> some of you have been through hurt so awful that you've actually wondered if you'd ever be able to smile again because it hurt so much at that moment of time. But you know what? Generally speaking, God restores it and you move through that time of weeping and God brings back the joy. He just has a way of healing. But you know, this is not just an everyday truth. This is an eternal truth. And I want to explain this to you because this is a precious thought. How many of you remember in reading the Old Testament account of creation that the Bible says something, if you think about it, that's rather strange. After describing the creative work every day, the Bible says this, and the evening and the morning we're the first day. Now, what's wrong with that class? Isn't that upside down? Isn't that backwards? Isn't it morning and evening is the first day? But in God's calendar, it's not like that. In God's calendar, he says it's the evening and the morning, and that's the first day. And you know what? There's a wonderful little practical thought there if you'll just grab hold of it. How many of you know that if you start the day the night before in the thought process, in the planning process, in the thinking process, the next day will always go better. If you sit down at night and read just a little bit from the Word of God before you go to bed and kind of look over the things you're going to do the next day and say, Lord, these are the thoughts that I have as I look at tomorrow and just bless them. You know what will happen? You'll go to bed that night and God will organize those things in your mind while you're sleeping and you'll get up the next day and the evening and the morning will be the day. I think it's important to start early with God, but maybe we should start even earlier. Maybe we should start the night before. But here's the precious truth about eternity. Right now, you and I are living in the evening time of life. But the Bible says there's going to be a morning that dawns someday. And all of the sorrow and the sadness and the difficulty that we have known in our nighttime of life is going to be all gone in the dawning of that new day when the Lord comes back. And guess what? When he returns, there's not going to be any more ups and downs. There's not going to be any more weeping and sorrow and difficulty and challenges. He's going to heal every hurt and take away every sickness and restore every blemish. And there is going to be joy in the morning. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us today. Maybe this is a program that God designed just for you. He does that, you know. Sometimes when I preach, people come and tell me that God used a message to change their life. And for, I can't figure out how the message I preached did that. But God took my words and, and the Holy Spirit used those words to change the heart of the person who listens. And if you think that happens in my church on the weekend, just imagine how it happens over the many hundreds of radio stations that carry this program. And we just pause to say, thank you, Lord, for caring enough about us to give your word to us, to encourage us every day. Tomorrow, part two of Life's Ups and Downs as we finish the week together. I hope you'll join us at that time. Don't forget to check out the Caribbean Conference Cruise at the end of the year, which leaves in December and comes back in January and bridges the two years. Beautiful cruise, lots of wonderful guests. You can get more information about it at davidjeremiah.org slash events. Thank you for joining us today. Have a great day. See you tomorrow. For more information on Dr. Jeremiah's series, When Your World Falls Apart, please visit our website where you'll also find two free ways to help you stay connected, our monthly magazine, Turning Points, and our daily email devotional. Sign up today at davidjeremiah.org radio. That's davidjeremiah.org radio. 
or call us at 800-947-1993. Ask for your copy of David's book, Sleep on This, a nighttime devotional with biblical reflections to bring you peace and rest. It's yours for a gift of any amount. You can also purchase the Jeremiah Study Bible in the English Standard, New International, and New King James versions with notes and articles from Dr. Jeremiah's decades of study. Get all the details when you visit our website, davidjeremiah.org radio. This is David Michael Jeremiah. Join us tomorrow as we continue the series, When Your World Falls Apart, on Turning Point with Dr. David Jeremiah. The roller coaster of life comes with crazy twists, unpredictable turns, and sudden drops. But you can take comfort in knowing you never have to ride it alone. Today on Turning Point, Dr. David Jeremiah offers a reminder that God is always with you, just as he was with King David through his many highs and lows. Listen now as David introduces the conclusion of his message, Life's Ups and Downs. I want to thank you for joining us today. We're studying the Psalms, which is always a blessing. And uh, these are particular psalms because these are the psalms that the Lord used to encourage my heart when I was returning from uh, my uh, two bouts with cancer many years ago. I took great notes and learned a lot from these psalms. Ultimately, I uh, wrote a book that was based upon these psalms called A Bend in the Road. The book was changed in its title from A Bend in the Road to When Your World Falls Apart, but it's the same book and the same study. And uh, I think, having been so freshly uh, touched in my body uh, with this uh, terrible sickness, my heart was really tender toward the Lord, and the Psalms meant so much to me. So he, these are those Psalms, and uh, we're in, in the middle of Psalm 30. We'll get back to part two of our discussion of Psalm 30, which we have called Life's Ups and Downs. By the way, friends, there's a study guide and a CD album that goes with this series, which you can order from Turning Point. It's all of the notes and outlines of the messages in the series, plus all of the audio recordings of the, uh, when they were first delivered. And it's a very special way to go back and reprise this series and remember what you learned and to be able to share it with others, perhaps in a small group or a, or a Sunday school class or wherever you have the opportunity to introduce God's Word. This information is available, once again, from davidjeremiah.org. You can get that information immediately by going to that website. Well, let's finish up this discussion of Psalm 30 as we close out the week together. This is part two of Life's Ups and Downs. Notice David is gone now from hurting to healing. And then notice the purpose for his healing, which is in the fourth verse, and we'll touch on that a little bit later, but he just says, he turns now and addresses the people, and he says, sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. When people have prayed for somebody who is sick and God raises them up, it's just as much their responsibility to praise God for the healing as it was for them to pray for the healing in the first place. And I know that for many of you, you've prayed for those who've been ill, but have you always been careful to give praise to God when he has healed them? Sometimes when the healing comes, the pressure's off and we forget. We're so careful to say, Lord, if you'll do this, I'll give you praise, but then we don't often do it. So David exhorts the people, sing praise, you his saints, and give thanks to God and remember his goodness because of his healing. Now you see, the first contrast is one of going from hurting or ill health to healing. And it's kind of a long way between the two. He goes secondly to another contrast from hurting to healing and now from weeping to joy. Notice what verse five says. It says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. From weeping to joy. Now, most of the time, weeping and joy don't go together. I've noticed one exception, and that is that sometimes women cry when they're happy. I don't understand that completely, but I've seen them say, I'm just so happy, you know, and I'm trying to figure that out. I can't understand it, you know. <laughs> but most of the time, weeping goes with sadness and joy goes with gladness. 
And David now is talking about this big chasm that exists between the ups and the downs of weeping and joy. And you know, you can experience those things in just a moment of time. You can be filled with joy one moment and in tears the next because events change and things happen. I want you to notice two things about this little expression, this little contrast between weeping and joy. First of all, this is an everyday truth. This doesn't even necessarily have to come from the Bible to be true, but it is true. It's good common sense that when a person's going through a difficult thing, you can usually say to that person with meaning and not be false in doing it, you know what, it's not gonna be like this forever. Just hang on, it's gonna get better. Just hang on, you'll get through this. One of the great verses of the Bible, which has been a bit misinterpreted with this little phrase, is, but I like this misinterpretation. Some guy was asked what his favorite verse in the Bible was, and he said his favorite verse in the Bible was this, and it came to pass. It didn't come to stay, it came to pass. And you know, and that's kind of the way it is. A lot of people think, you know, when you go through trouble, it's forever. But the Bible says, weeping comes in the nighttime, but joy comes in the morning. And it is true, this is an everyday truth. And I see this all the time as a pastor. Sometimes when we're paying tribute to someone that we've loved who has gone on to be with the Lord, and you look at the sadness in the faces of the family members and you think, it'll never ever be all right with them. But then a year later or so, you see that somehow God has healed over the open wound and he's brought back some gladness and joy. I was talking with a pastor friend of mine just recently. They've just gone through some tragic things with one of their children. And his wife said, I looked at my husband the other day and I said, I wonder if we'll ever smile again. <laughs> some of you have been through hurt so awful that you've actually wondered if you'd ever be able to smile again because it hurt so much at that moment in time. But you know what? Generally speaking, God restores it and you move through that time of weeping and God brings back the joy. He just has a way of healing. But you know, this is not just an everyday truth. This is an eternal truth. And I want to explain this to you because this is a precious thought. How many of you remember in reading the Old Testament account of creation that the Bible says something, if you think about it, that's rather strange. After describing the creative work every day, the Bible says this, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, what's wrong with that class? Isn't that upside down? Isn't that backwards? Isn't it morning and evening is the first day? But in God's calendar, it's not like that. In God's calendar, he says it's the evening and the morning, and that's the first day. And you know what? There's a wonderful little practical thought there if you'll just grab hold of it. How many of you know that if you start the day the night before in the thought process, in the planning process, in the thinking process, the next day will always go better? If you sit down at night and read just a little bit from the Word of God before you go to bed and kind of look over the things you're gonna do the next day and say, Lord, these are the thoughts that I have as I look at tomorrow and just bless them. You know what will happen? You'll go to bed that night and God will organize those things in your mind while you're sleeping and you'll get up the next day and the evening and the morning will be the day. I think it's important to start early with God, but maybe we should start even earlier. Maybe we should start the night before. But here's the precious truth about eternity. Right now, you and I are living in the evening time of life. But the Bible says there's going to be a morning that dawns someday. And all of the sorrow and the sadness and the difficulty that we have known in our nighttime of life is going to be all gone in the dawning of that new day when the Lord comes back. And guess what? When he returns, there's not going to be any more ups and downs. There's not going to be any more weeping and sorrow and difficulty and challenges. He's going to heal every hurt and take away every sickness and restore every blemish. And there is going to be joy in the morning. <laughs> Weeping may be ours for now, and it is probably ours. And that's a great thing. Amen. It's a wonderful thing that God has given to us. So here is this contrast from weeping to joy. Now notice the third one. This everyday eternal truth is followed in the text by number three, and that is from prosperity to poverty. Notice what David says in verse six. Once again, he takes us on this roller coaster experience. He says, 
Now in my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by your favor, you have made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face and I was in trouble. Now, if I can take this out of the New King James language and just put it down in the practical terms, what David is saying is this. I look back on my life and there was a time in my life when I was very prosperous. And the foolishness of his prosperity is illustrated in what he said at such a time. Watch carefully and look at your Bibles. He said, in my prosperity, I said, now watch this, I shall never be moved. In other words, I have now become invulnerable. Nothing can touch me. I am so prosperous that I am now in control of my life. You say, what a foolish thing. But you know what? That is where a lot of people get when they get very wealthy. They get to the place where they think, you know, I've got my life in control. I've got all the money I'll ever need. And nothing can touch me. But then how many of you know the cycle that goes people giving up their health to get their wealth. And when they get their wealth, they have to get their wealth to get their health back. (laughs) You know, it kind of goes like that, doesn't it? But you know, it's kind of foolish, isn't it? To think that prosperity would make you totally and perfectly secure. And yet that's what David said. And it reminds me of 1 Corinthians 10, 12, where we read, let him that thinketh he stand take heed lest he fall. You know, what a foolish thing to think that because you have resources that you are perfectly safe. You can get one phone call from the doctor that'll blow that right out the window. You know what? I'm not against having what you need and uh, being successful in what you do, but the whole point of it is if you think that makes you safe from any of the ills of life, you're just not thinking straight. I'm reminded of a man in the Old Testament who got this mixed up pretty good. His name was Nebuchadnezzar. And he was the king of Babylon, the great empire of the Babylonians. And one day, according to the book of Daniel, he was walking through his palace, Daniel chapter 4, verse 29, and he was walking through the palace in Babylon, and this is what he said. Now watch this. And the king spoke, saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? And while the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven, saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. <laughs> I read that. I mean, he was walking along and just admiring everything. He says, you know, this is, man, look what I built. Look what I did. I did this. You know what? I did it for me. I didn't do it for anybody else. I did it for my majesty. And while the word was in his mouth, heaven spoke and said, you just lost the kingdom, son. It's over. And you remember the rest of the story? God wasn't finished with Nebuchadnezzar because he was going to use him as an illustration for all of us. And if you don't believe this story, you go back and read it in the book of Daniel because this is really in the Bible. Nebuchadnezzar became the world's first wolf man. Did you know that? He was translated into a wolf man so that he spent the next seven years eating grass out in the field like a beast. Guess what happened? At the end of seven years, he was restored just as the prophecy had been told. (laughs) And I want to read to you what he said in Daniel 4, 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. All of those works are truth and his ways justice. And watch this. And those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. Right on, King Nebuchadnezzar. He wasn't too bright, but he learned that. Seven years of eating grass has got to teach you something, right? And he realized that what he had learned was that when you get puffed up with who you are in prosperity, God can bring you down in a moment. And David's talking about that very thing, going from prosperity to poverty in one day, the ups and downs of life. Did you know there's a wonderful prayer in the Bible, and I'm just going to throw this in for free. It's a wonderful prayer that maybe all of us ought to pray more, and I think about this prayer once in a while, and I need to remind you of it often. It's found in Proverbs chapter 30, verses 8 and 9, and this is what it says. Remove falsehood and lies far from me. Now watch this. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food allotted to me, lest I be full and deny you, and say, Who is the Lord? 
or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Isn't that an interesting prayer? It's a prayer for balance. And in our world today, it would be simply this, Lord, give me everything that I need, everything you bless me with that won't get in the way of my relationship with you. But don't give me any more than that because it's not worth having the things of this life if they end up keeping you from knowing God and have an eternal life forever and ever. The contrast of prosperity and poverty. And let me give you the fourth one that's in the psalm. The contrast from mourning to dancing. Verse 11, now watch this. David says, you have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. And verse 11 is one of the main reasons why scholars believe that this psalm goes with 2 Samuel. Because let me tell you the rest of the story of bringing back the ark. Do you remember that story? David's coming back into the city with the ark of the covenant and he's got the band playing and people rejoicing. And he's wearing his clerical robe, his linen ephod, says the scripture. And then the Bible says this that David danced with all of his might before the Lord. And you know what? That's a really troubling passage to a lot of people. And I spent a lot of time in that Old Testament text and I looked up the word danced and you know what it means? It means danced. But I want to tell you, this wasn't dancing socially. This wasn't dancing at line dance or whatever they do in the country and western stuff. This was David dancing before the Lord in exhilaration because of what God had done. He just got so overwhelmed with God's blessing and the beauty and majesty of that moment that he couldn't contain himself. David went from mourning and wearing sackcloth to dancing in the robe of gladness. Isn't life full of ups and downs? Isn't life overwhelmingly a life of extremes. Some days it is almost more than you can handle in the context of 24 hours, the extreme emotions that we go through. And then there's one last one and I'll cover it quickly. It's in the last verse and that is from silence to singing. To the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. This is a reminder of how many of us keep silence in spite of the fact that God has blessed us so much. And the great lesson here is the lesson of God's wonderful blessing upon us when things are going well, and yet God is still there when things aren't going so well. God is in the room when you get news of some great accomplishment, some award, but God is also in the hospital room when you get news of some difficult situation that you have to face. He's always with you in the ups and downs, and that's why the thing that we're told to do here at the end of the psalm is whether it's up or down, we're to praise God. Notice, oh my God, I will give thanks to you forever. And if you go back in your Bibles to the fourth verse, here the thing is said again. Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. The one thought that you don't want to lose from Psalm 30 is this. Whether you're going through weeping or joy, give thanks to God. Whether you're in an uptime or a downtime, give thanks to God. If you're experiencing prosperity or poverty, give thanks to God. If you're in times of dancing or mourning, give thanks to God. Don't ever forget that the one constant in all of it is that God is there. He understands. Don't be afraid when you're in the pit to lift up your hands and your voices to God and say, God, I don't understand this, but I give you praise and I give you thanks. One of the things that happens to us when we go through a downtime is that we forget all of the other things that are good. You know, we lose a loved one in death and it's the most difficult thing. And yet oftentimes when that happens, God has left us with others to comfort and encourage our hearts. And we need to give thanks. And when you start giving thanks to God, he puts it in perspective. Do you know of all the things about life that I have the hardest time with, it's this cycle stuff, this up and down stuff. You know, I just get myself geared up for a good, you know, a good run. And then something happens that turns it in another direction. But I've got to learn, and I think God is teaching me, maybe he's teaching you, that all of these things are for his glory and his purpose. And he's got a reason why he allows the things into our lives that sometimes we don't understand. 
I feel a lot better about this after reading something that I want to share with you in closing. I'm not much of a scientist, though I like to read the accomplishments of scientists. But I learned something that is one of the most amazing stories that I've ever heard from the animal kingdom. One of the most unique animals that God ever created is the giraffe. It's a strange looking creature, isn't it? I don't know if you've ever read about the birthing of giraffe calves, but I want to tell you that story as we close. I read this in something written by a guy named Gary Richmond, and I'll read it and tell you some of it in his words, but I don't think you'll forget this because I know I never will. He had been invited to a zoo where they had a captive giraffe that was about to give birth so that he could watch the process. He said, the moment we had anticipated was not a disappointment. A calf, a plucky male, hurled forth, falling 10 feet and landing on his back. The mother giraffe gives birth to its young standing up, and the distance from the birth canal to the ground is about 10 feet. Now, I don't know if you know how high that is, but that's how high you have to jump if you're gonna dunk a basketball. So this calf fell out of its mother 10 feet above ground and landed on its back. And it lays there for a few moments, and then, according to the story, it scrambles over and gets up on its legs with its legs underneath it so that it can look out and see what's going on. Well, the mother giraffe lowers her head long enough to take a quick look. Then she positions herself though, so she's standing directly over the calf. She waits for about a minute, and then she does this most unreasonable thing. Now listen to this. She swings her pendulous leg outward and kicks her baby so that it is sent sprawling head over heels on the ground. Gary turned to the zoologist and he said, what's that all about? Well, the zoologist said, she wants it to get up. <laughs> and if it doesn't get up, she's gonna do it again. Sure enough, the process was repeated again and again. And the struggle to rise was momentous, and as the baby grew tired of trying, the mother would again stimulate its effort with a hearty kick. <laughs> Amidst the cheers of the animal care staff, the calf stood up finally for the first time. Wobbly for sure, but there it stood on its little spindly legs. Then we were struck silent when the mother kicked it off its feet again. And Gary's friend was the only one not astonished by the female's brutal treatment of the newborn calf. She wants it to remember how it got up, he said. <laughs> That's why she knocked it down again. In the wild, it would need to get up as soon as possible to follow the herd. Now listen carefully. The mother needs the herd, too, for safety. Because out there, there are lions and hyenas and leopards and hunting dogs, all that would enjoy having a young giraffe for dinner. And they'd get it too if the mother didn't teach her baby so quickly to get up and get on with it. And I'm reminded that one of the reasons we have some of the challenges in our lives is that God is toughening us up and preparing us so that we don't get chewed up by those things out there that are really trying to destroy us. I don't know if you've ever felt it, but I've felt the foot of the Lord on an occasion, you know, kicking me back and saying, you know, get with it preparing you, toughening you up. The ups and downs of life are not always just happenstance. Sometimes God brings those things into our life for a purpose, that he might strengthen us and make us the kind of people that he can trust and use in the days that are before us. I'm glad my father's more gentle than the giraffe. <laughs> but nonetheless, he's the one often who is behind the ups and downs of our life. And the thing that's so precious about that is he's always there. So give him praise, saints. Don't be afraid to lift your heart and say, Lord, I don't know what this is all about, but I give you praise and I thank you. You're up to something, God, and I don't need to know what it is right now, but I give you praise. And one day you'll be up on your feet walking, protected when the moment comes that you need it. Well, I can't tell you how much I really believe what I've just said, because I know what it's like to be in the difficult days. I haven't had nearly as many as many of you, my friends. I've had my share, but nothing like so many of you who have suffered in the majority part of your life. 
but God cares about you. And this book we call the Bible, and especially the section of it we call the Psalms, is the absolute demonstration of God's love and care for you. He opens your heart and then puts this wonderful truth in to help you get through your difficult days. So uh, if you're in one of those ups and downs times in your life, maybe particularly the down part, let God's Word wash over your heart and, and uh, baptize your soul in its truth, and uh, it will straighten things out for you. Hey, have a wonderful weekend, you guys. I know that you have church on the agenda. We're on television almost everywhere, and uh, make it a week that honors the Lord and brings glory and, and majesty to His name. He's worth it. We'll see you Monday. The message you just heard originated from Shadow Mountain Community Church and senior pastor, Dr. David Jeremiah. Turning Point is also on radio and TV this weekend. To learn where to find it, visit our website, davidjeremiah.org slash radio. That's davidjeremiah.org slash radio. Or call 800-947-1993. Ask for your copy of David's book, Sleep on This, a nighttime devotional with biblical reflections to bring you peace and rest. It's yours for a gift of any amount. You can also purchase the Jeremiah Study Bible in the English Standard, New International, and New King James versions with notes and articles from Dr. Jeremiah's decades of study. Let us know how your faith is growing right to Turning Point, P.O. Box 3838, San Diego, California, 92163. This is David Michael Jeremiah. Join us Monday as we continue the series when you're...